Hey, my name is Jennifer Eggert. And again, excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. So <laughs> just make sure if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, my, my, my voice is not, it's typical. Um, so I am a clinical psychologist. I live uh, and work in New York City. Um, uh, I come from a family of people with FSHD. My dad had it. I, I lost him a couple of years ago. Um, and then my two aunts have it. My grandfather probably had it, but was sort of never diagnosed. Um, he was more mild. I was diagnosed... I'm 55 now. I was diagnosed probably when I was around 32, um, but I noticed things and I knew what it was a little bit earlier than that. Um, so I am a clinical psychologist and most of my work um, when I went to graduate school was really focusing on people with health issues. And I'm sure, you know, even though I wasn't diagnosed at the time, I was certainly influenced by uh, people dealing with medical issues and disability, um, just growing up in a family where we were, uh, we had this and, um, and, and dealt with that. Um, and so I worked in hospitals for many years. I'm in private practice now, but I worked as a hospital psychologist working in uh, medical rehab units and palliative care and with oncology and a wide range of medical um, sessions. I work from a mindfulness-based perspective, um, which is integrating mindfulness and mindfulness meditation, mindfulness philosophy and psychology in um in my work with people um and i don't work just with people with medical issues i work with people with depression anxiety a wide range of of mental health concerns as well um but this idea of like sort of this mind body work has been part of uh, my work as a psychologist really since the very beginning yeah so that's me that's helpful and then were there a few key items that you want to hit on as well, or do you want this to be more Q and A based? Yeah, you know, I guess I was just sort of wondering how how you all would would want it. I I do have like a you know I have like a little sort of prepared thing, but we are a small group too, so um, I don't. I generally am pretty interactive when I when I give a talk, and if people would like to hear a, a little bit of something, then I I do have some some material that I can provide, um, or uh, we could begin sort of with a little bit of a discussion. Um, either way is fine, fine by me. Do, do, do people have like a preference? I think since we do have a decent bit of time, if you want to start with the prepared aspect, that might be useful for the recording. Okay, good. So I just thought I would talk a little bit about, um, just because, you know, Zach had said, you guys are interested in sort of mind-body connections. And um, so what I would just start by saying is that, you know, this like this dualistic idea that our mind and body are actually separate is sort of historically, you know, it's very long historical view when really it's not um, accurate. Our, our brains, our bodies are all one, one organism and what is going on in our brains is going on in our bodies what is going on in our bodies is going on in our brains that we may experience them as different like you know we talk about my body as if it is something that's separate from who we are um, or my mind as if this is um a, you know some sort of a, a different uh part of identity or uh, experience as a human being, really we're all the things, but we've been very trained to kind of separate these two things. You know, we go to, uh, you know, uh, one place to deal with our mental health, another place to deal with our physical health, and not, not often do the two of them come together. But certainly I think especially in more recent years, there's been much more of an integration. You see a lot of integrative medicine programs, a lot of research on um, things like mindfulness, as well as other uh, kind of interventions that work with the idea of wellness and health um, as something that comes from both our mental and physical balance, that they're just seen as one in the same. Um, how our bodies are designed too, in terms of um, the fight and flight mechanism, I just wanna talk about this because this is um, 
how it is that our organisms deal with stress. Um, we've developed a, a fight or flight mechanism. It's evolutionarily a part of how we deal with threat in our lives. Um, it is a system that in response to a threat, when we were in the you know bush and a saber-toothed tiger was coming our way, our body had a very specific way of responding to threat. Um, what would happen is they would see the tiger and then um, our respiration rate would go up, right? So we could get more oxygen to the muscles that might need to either fight the saber-toothed tiger or run like hell. Um, so our respiration rate would go up, our heart rate would go up similarly to pump blood um, faster and get nutrients to the extremities so that we can deal with what we need to do. Our pupils would dilate so we can get more information in, in the environment and we can decide what, what, what would be the safest thing. So all of this is coming from the perspective of the, how do we protect ourselves and how do we survive? So the pupils dilate, digestion slows down because that takes a lot of energy. So in a, in a moment of threat, the body doesn't want to be dealing with all the energy around digestion. So the digestion kind of like slows down and a whole other host of chemicals, you know, uh, we're flooded with hormones and adrenaline so that we can deal with this situation so that we can survive. Um, what you see when you watch these, you know, sort of animal, you know, if you've watched the animal programs and you see like the, the antelope that, you know, is, you know, notices oh, the, the lion or whatever is around it. And, you know, runs like hell. And when they realize that they're out of the, um, the range of danger, then, you know, they just kind of like, okay. And they turn around and they start grazing again. Um, so what they do is they've got all of these, these hormonal and physiological changes to protect themselves and they use them in that sort of way. And then when the threat is gone, then they kind of return to a baseline and go back to their way of living. They're not sitting around. They're like, Oh my God, did you see that tiger? That was pretty scary. You know, Oh my God, what if they come back again? So this is the difference between people in the animal kingdom and us human beings. We have this brain, which has us relive that experience over and over and over again. Like, oh my God, it could have died. That could happen again. What if it does happen again? And then we are really stuck in this. We don't return to the baseline and start grazing again, but we have this continuous um, flood of stress hormones in our body, which can really cause a lot of problems, problems with digestion, problems with our heart, the feeling of anxiety, panic. Panic is the fight or flight mechanism being activated and not being used for what it's meant to. So when we do things like exercise or, um, yeah, really exercise is kind of like the equivalent of using those hormones, those stress hormones, um, for what it is that they're meant for. Um, part of the problem is with FSHD, it can be really hard to exercise in the kind of vigorous way that helps us move stress hormones through our body. Um, part of the reason why I'm sort of presenting this is for, for us to really recognize the integration between stress and our mental health and the body, that this is one system that interacts um, and functions in its own, you know, in, in one sort of way. So just like we have a fight or flight mechanism to help protect us in the face of stress, we also have a relaxation response, a relaxation mechanism. So when we are relaxed, when we go to bed at night, um, kind of the reverse happens. Heart rate slows down. Uh, respiration rate deepens and slows down. Um, there are hormones and, and neurochemicals that flow through our body to help our bodies relax. Blood flow goes to um, uh, the muscles to relax things. Uh, digestion is most active when we're relaxed. So 
we can address our stress level sometimes through our minds by, you know, talking to ourselves, telling ourselves different things about the stress that we're facing. But sometimes it's really kind of hard to change our mind. And sometimes it's a little bit easier to work with the body uh, first, that if we can learn how to relax our body, it communicates to our mind, okay, I'm relaxed. Or so sometimes it can be a little bit easier going in that way. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, so again, just stressing this idea that our mental well-being um, impacts our physical health and our physical health can impact our mental well-being, that this is dualistic. This is not one or the other, but it's this interaction uh, back and forth. So this, this is termed a biopsychosocial perspective. I often add like the spiritual perspective in there too, although I don't have that in this slide. So the idea is that um, our psychological well-being impacts our biological state. Our biological state impacts our social state. Social impacts biological, biological and psychological. And we know this. If we think about FSHD, like I think about it, like in the past year, I've had some significant decline in my condition, right? And the things that I'm noticing about that is as things are getting harder for me to do, I've been more socially isolated, that I haven't really had the energy to uh, make plans with people. Um, and what happens when we're more socially isolated, right? How does that impact us emotionally? Right? So you feel, start feeling a little bit lonely. I start feeling a little bad for myself. You know, this, this really sucks. I start worrying what's going to happen in the future and all of those things. So this is a shift in my biological state that all of a sudden is impacting not just how I'm feeling physically and what I can do physically, but my interactions with other people as well as my mental well-being, right? Right. So... I guess, I guess I can't, yeah, um, I, I, I'm being a little repetitive here, but sort of stressing this sort of interaction between each of these aspects of our lives. Um, similarly, I just had a wonderful weekend away with uh, my, my mom and seeing some friends upstate and seeing some cousins. And so I had this really beautiful social weekend and boy, did that feel good emotionally and yeah it was hard physically but i i wasn't so focused on what was hard because i my attention was really focused on other things and i was engaged in other things so here's an example of sort of social engagement and how that impacted on biology i wasn't particularly thinking about pain i wasn't so focused on that, it doesn't mean that it wasn't there, but it wasn't really the focus of my attention. So I felt okay, and I was able to do things, and I did what I could, and I made my way around things so I could do what I wanted to do, and, and then mood was elevated. So when we talk about sort of mind-body connections and FSHD, there's stuff that happens on a biological level um, that we can sort of intervene with. Um, there's clearly like benefits of movement and exercise, physical therapy. Um, you know, I do a, a lot of, not a lot of, but I do some chair yoga, um, which I find really helpful in just, you know, in really simple ways with not, not worrying about how, good I am at or but just sort of moving my body. The other thing, um, I, I'm, I'm still ambulatory. I'm still able to walk. I walk with a, a walking stick right now. Um, and I have this little mini trampoline that has a, a, a handlebar. So I'm able to hold on to it. And I've been doing that as a sort of movement. And I find like even that kind of movement, it's a little joyous. So it affects my mood. So things that we can do movement-wise, whatever it is, as simple as it can be, can definitely impact us in a lot of 
other ways, emotionally, uh, as well as physically. And we, we know that there's a lot that's coming out right now about our nutrition and about um, inflammation and how that impacts uh, particularly like pain and, um, and functioning. I, I, I don't consider myself an expert in these areas, but I'm interested in it. Um, but it, another thing to sort of dive deep into for, um, for our well-being, as well as other complementary medicine. I, I do a lot of massage, which is particularly helpful. Um, and for those of us that suffer from anxiety and depression, there's a lot of ways of helping with that, including medication management, um, which can be enormously helpful, uh, particularly with depression. You know, from a psychological standpoint, you know, there's so many different ways that we can help support our mental well-being. You know, there's counseling and psychotherapy. Um, th there's been one study on um, ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy amongst people with um, FSHD as well as other um, uh, neuromuscular diseases, which has shown real considerable benefits. I work a little bit from that perspective. Um, uh, and if people are interested in learning more about that, I'm happy to tell them about that. Um, but just having a space where people can feel free to talk about what's going on as they're dealing with changes in their bodies and their lives um, is a very powerful thing. And um, doing that in the context of a group um, something like this. I don't know. I know you guys are sort of, uh, I, I'm not sure how long you guys, how long have you guys been going? It started earlier this year, but um, I think most of the people here are new. So. Yeah. And, and it's that, you know, it takes some time before people start feeling really comfortable with one another. And, um, and you begin to realize that, you know, you've got a safe space, but I will say, um, having met people through the FSHD Society who are going through this um, has been an enormous support. And as I've gone through this decline that I've gone through in the past year, um, you know, I've, I've called some people and talked to them about what I'm going through. And the Wellness Hour has been helpful, as well as the Women on Wellness group, um, which I attend from time to time. Um, it's really good to know people who have been through what you're going through have gone through what you're going through um, or, ha um, or are going through it with you um, to recognize that, you know, we're really not alone in this. Um, and counseling and psychotherapy isn't for everyone, and I don't think everyone should do it, but, you know, clearly I believe in it because I'm a, a psychologist. Um, and I'm, again, I'm happy to talk to people about this. And we don't have to do it in the context of this group. I'll give my contact information. I'm always willing to talk to people if they've got questions, if they're interested and they want to know what to look for, because it really can seem like a maze out there. What do you look for and who should you look for? Um, but a lot of people also really like um, going for spiritual counseling. If they're connected to a spiritual community, that that can be really helpful or coaches. There's like health coaches out there. Um, I have less experience with that. Um, but again, coming from the perspective that we realize that when we're taking care of our mental health, we're also taking care of our physical health. I mean, I think every, can people relate to the idea when you're in a good mood, how do you feel physically? Does it impact how you feel physically? To an extent, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And when you're having a really bad day, how does that impact your physical health? Probably feel a little bit worse. Yeah. I know when I'm having a rough day emotionally, everything feels so much harder to do. Yeah. So it's, it's not like magic pixie dust or anything. It really is that if, if something's in front of us and we feel like we are, are capable of managing it, it enables us uh, to do a lot more than when we're really feeling kind of hopeless and unable to do things. And then from the social side of things, um, you know, there's so many different forms of support. You know, there's emotional support, 
But sometimes we don't need emotional support. Sometimes we, what we really need is practical support. We need someone to just come over and help us to load the car when we're going away. Or we need someone to just kind of uh, help us cook a meal or, or uh, take care of something um, that is a little bit too hard physically. So being really clear on what it is that we need help with, because people can offer help and it's not always the kind of help we need. You know, sometimes people want to offer a lot of practical things, but what we really need is someone to just sit with us uh, and uh, know that we're not alone. Um, and, and, you know, uh, there's, there's this um, metaphor. Um, I think I spoke about this at the Orlando meeting of this idea that um, it, uh, it's this metaphor came from, I heard it first with Jack Kornfeld, um, who is a meditation teacher um, that, you know, if you imagine like life is like a juice glass. Um, so it's you know, one of those small little juice glass and, and all of our stress and difficulties are like a tablespoon of salt, heaping tables. And you put it in that juice glass and you try to drink it down. You know, it, it would be like unpalatable. It'd be like, ugh. but if you take that same tablespoon of salt and you put it in a lake and you go to drink from like maybe right where you dropped it, you'll, you'll know that it's there. But in time, it's going to dissipate and it's going to be absorbed by that lake. And so when we think of life in this kind of way, and, you know, with FSHD, our lives can be, start becoming really, really small because of energy levels, physical abilities, you know, all and everything that comes with that our lives start becoming like those little juice glasses. So when one difficult thing happens, it's like overwhelming and un unmanageable. But when we have a little bit more of a lake-like life, right? Our lives a little bit more like a lake, whatever that is for you. For me, it's uh, music and friends, um, getting away, my family. It was my dog until I lost him. Um, doing art. These are the things that make my life feel, feel like broader. So that when that tablespoon of salt, that difficulty comes, and it's not if, because it will come. It comes for everyone, whether you have FSHD or not. Um, I have a life where it's not just that. There's a lot more going on. So when I write fun friends in here, that's what I was really thinking about. That I have my friends that I know I can count on that actually make jokes with me right now. They know in New York City that um, Madison Square Garden and all of the concert venues that they own have a disability service office. So if there's a concert coming to town, I know that I'll be able to get tickets through the Office of Disability Services because there's disabled seating and I can bring friends along. So they, they joke with me. I was like, all right. We need the disability perk. We're going to go to this concert together. And they help me and we go. And it's, I know that I have this group of people that is going to keep me engaged in life, um, no matter what my functioning is. Um, having shared purposeful activities, things that bring meaning to you, whatever that is, you know, these are the things that help us stay connected and have more of a lake-like life. Connecting to spiritual communities, if, if that is, is meaningful to you, or other communities like this one. Um, I, I can't not say something about meditation because it's a big part of what I do and a big way that I, I cope. Um, there's been a lot of research on meditation um, and in helping people with depression and anxiety and improvement of chronic pain. There seems to be an immune function that is improved as a result of meditation. Um, uh, and they think it sort of operates a little bit through inflammation pathways. Um, certainly it helps lower cortisol, which is a big inflammation marker. So Meditation for me is one of my number one ways of um, my mind-body stress management. 
And uh, I'm trained to teach MBSR, a mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a eight-week course that's been very, very well researched, um, originally developed by John Kabat-Zinn at the Center for um, Mindfulness at UMass, but now it's located at Brown University. Um, there's so many MBSR courses that if you're interested in mindfulness, um, you're welcome to reach out to me and, and discuss it. Um, I do a lot of meditation workshops with people through the FSHD Society, uh, and that's certainly something that I would be happy to come back and do with you all if you're interested in learning meditation. Um, I hadn't really planned so much on doing it tonight because it was kind of like our first meeting. That doesn't mean we can't do a little bit if you wish. Um, but I think I'll kind of stop there. Um, and then... If you want to do a little meditation, we can do that. Great. Um, that um, we can certainly do some meditation today if that's what people are interested in. Um, but I wanted to, you know, there's just like a little bit of background. When I think of mind-body stuff, these are the things that I think about. And um, I guess I would love to hear from you all about um, what your questions are or how is it that you help manage the physical, emotional, social demands of this disease and what's useful for you or, or, or wherever it is you might like to start or share. Uh, you're welcome, Lacey. And to see in the meeting chat, just read that. Yeah, so I'd love to hear from anyone who feels like sharing and share as much or as little as, as you desire. There's no pressure here. Or if you have questions about anything I just said. Hi, if I may. Um, this is Rakesh. Hi, Rakesh. Um, hey. So um, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I, I mean, as far as you, you know, when you talk about mindfulness meditation, it's, um, you know, um, I, I could relate a lot. Um, um, I'm 52 and I wasn't diagnosed with. Uh, uh, FSD till recently, um, uh, but I had it, you know, since my teens and, um, I can say enough that if I was not, and I started meditating in, in my early twenties, but had I not been able to, um, if I was not meditating, I don't think how I, I would have been able to cope, cope my, the life I did, um, you know, all along. So it's what do you helped me to, yeah. What do you notice about how it helps? Um, the, well, so, so let, let me, um, let me, uh, back up, back up a little bit. Um, so when I had the big, you know, uh, muscle loss, uh, or, you know, the body shock you go through when you start getting the symptoms of FSD, um, I was, um, very in a very dark place, very depressed, very, uh, you know, I'd lost my parents at the same time. Um, um, and I was by myself, um, financially, emotionally. Uh, and then I was getting the symptoms of, uh, the muscle dystrophy. So it was, it was really difficult. And I mean, that, that kind of made me look, you know, for relief and, you know, I searched and searched and when I hit meditation, I felt I had, I had the right spot and it did bring me up, uh, pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, so yeah, that, that was kind of my journey. It was, it was my, um, uh, introspection, introspection, uh, you know, searching for relief. That's what kind of, uh, you know, brought me to that path. Yeah. It, it's amazingly powerful. I, I, you know, I appreciate you sharing this. I, I started with meditation actually after September 11th, living in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I was like having panic symptoms and I, I knew I needed something to help me. And I was working at the VA medical center at the time. And I, I started doing some training in mindfulness, actually through the Center for Mindfulness, learning 
um, MBSR and I started groups at the VA. Really, I started for myself <laughs> a little selfishly because I needed mm. help. The hardest part about doing it is like, you know, developing uh, a regular practice. And I just started meeting with veterans. You know, it started with me and mm. one veteran for a long time and then became a large regular group. Um, but yeah, I find that you know, it helps in sort of subtle ways, you know, it's not, it's not that, you know, I'm some Buddha that, you know, is so light that I float and hit my head up on the ceiling or anything, or that I've got it all figured out, but it definitely helps to have some perspective on things when they're going hard, um, to really know that everything changes and whatever's going on in this moment is this moment. And there will be another moment. And every time I tell myself, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I'm never going to get through this. I've never been. Has anyone ever been right when they told themselves, I'm never going to get through this? Think about it. Have you ever been right? No. Or we wouldn't be sitting here. And I think that's what meditation has helped me figure this, figure out, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. that it's not always easy but somehow yeah. we find our way you know yeah and you know i can relate how you know you mentioned how meditation or you know mindfulness whatever you know you want to call it how it, it helps you with pain you know sometimes you know when my body and muscles were in pain you know um, you kind of learn the technique to you know to move your mind away from that pain and you know it, it it will go away, but at that moment, you know, you, you can feel it like, yeah, your uh, the the training you have given to your mind it does help you, you know, take away from the from those thoughts or you know the real pain when you you need to the most. Yeah, so, I so definitely, I would say it's the best thing I've done in my life. Yeah. If there was anything, I would you know. Uh, any one point, one thing I've done to cope with my condition, that would be the mindfulness. Yeah, I would say that it not only helps like move your mind away from it, but also sh more than anything shifts our relationship to it. Um, so that when we're experiencing pain, we can see it in a different way. You know, I, I don't know how many people here experience pain. Do people experience pain related to FSHD? No, no. Okay. It's something I experience. Not everyone does. Mm. Alex, you do. Yeah. Um, not everybody does. Um, but there might be other symptoms, fatigue, um, or that we could bring a lot of emotional stuff. Um, yeah, Lacey knows some other people that do. We can bring our emotional attachment to it so that we're feeling really fatigued or something's really hard for us. And then it's like, Oh God, here's this, this is so terrible. And then, which of course, like who wants any of this, but it's uh, in um, there's a, a, a metaphor in Buddhist tradition that in any moment of suffering, and I'm not a Buddhist, by the way, I'm not trying to sell Buddhism, but um, uh, mindfulness comes from mindful psychology comes from Buddhist psychology. So, you know, it's, it's got similar roots, um, or at least the kind of meditation that I, I've learned and I teach, there's many different forms of meditation. So, um, but there's a analogy that in any moment of suffering, it's like we're being hit by two arrows and the first mm. arrow is the arrow of what life gives us. So FSHD, we don't have much choice in that matter. We get FSHD, we feel fatigued, we feel pain. Somebody pisses us off in the morning, our boss is being difficult. We're, you know, struggling financially or whatever it is. These are things that happen in life that we don't, they're just, everyone goes through stuff in life, whatever it is. But, and if we just dealt with that, that would be hard enough. But then it's like we get hit with a second arrow. And that second arrow is the arrow that we shoot at ourselves, which is what we tell ourselves. The first arrow means about who we are as human beings, about the past, about the future, um, about other people. So that's all the thoughts 
and feelings that we bring to something that's difficult in our lives. So in any moment of suffering, are we suffering because of a first arrow or a second arrow? First arrows, we bear and we find our way through. Second arrows are what we bring to the situation. And I don't say that in a blaming way. It's actually to me very empowering because if I understand, oh, this is something that I'm bringing to it, then there's maybe something that I can do about it. Yeah. And meditation helps me to figure out what are my second arrows. I think you listed quite a few practical things, including meditation within the PowerPoint that were helpful. One thing I wanted to get your perspective on was kind of in the moment, you may not have time to stop and meditate. If like in the moment where you start to have a little bit of a negative thought come in, you don't want that uh, spiral. How do you handle those situations? Yeah. So meditation isn't just like sitting on a cushion or a chair for an extended period of time and focusing on your breath or your body or what, but any moment can be a moment of mindfulness. So what mindfulness is, is paying attention on purpose. So it's this very intentional thing that we do. We pay attention on purpose to whatever is unfolding in the present moment. And the last piece is the kicker, which is non-judgmentally. So we bring this attitude of curiosity to whatever is unfolding. Okay. Um, there's a lot of really brief exercises. And actually in the PowerPoint, I had one of the brief exercises. I can actually email that to you if you want, Zach, and you could send it out to everybody. Um, and we could do it right now. It's this... Um, the stop technique, which is this very brief exercise. We can all do it together. Um, uh, Lacey, I'll get to you in a second. So we can just stop. So in any moment during the day, we can just stop. And if it's helpful to close your eyes to focus, you can do that. You don't have to. Take a breath. And when you take that breath, I want you to really notice how it feels to breathe in and to breathe out. So that's the T. Observe is asking the question, well, what, what's actually going on right now in my body? Is there an emotional tone that's present? And what's going on in my mind? Am I very active or quiet? And then we proceed on with our day. So this very brief exercise to stop, take a breath, Turn inward and tune in, mind, body, emotion, and just pause for a moment and then proceed. So Tara Brock, who's a meditation teacher, talks about the, the sacred pause. You know, John Kabat-Zinn says that meditation is like a radical act to just actually stop and not do. It's an act of non-doing. Um, so we can try that again here together, just like right now, just like, let's all stop for a second. Just stop and take a breath. Doesn't have to be deep or anything, but if you wish, that's fine. And then observe what's going on in my body right now. And just notice, without any expectation. And is there an emotion that's present or not? Again, no expectation. It doesn't have to be. And we could check in with the mind, you know, not so much getting lost in content, but is my mind active, quiet, judgmental, peaceful? And it's all fine. So we just notice what's present. Just taking a moment to notice that. And you can actually take a moment to notice breathing as you're paying attention to your body. 
and your mind. Knowing you don't have to do anything else right now. And then we could just proceed on with our day. So Zach, that's like a really brief exercise you can do. And there's other brief exercises that you can do. And I'm happy to share audios uh, with people um, for something like a three minute breathing space, which is just sort of like a brief three to five minute meditation as sort of like a bite of it, a taste of it. Um, and I'm also happy to come back and we could do a whole whole series of mindfulness. I'll give you some uh, a little bit of education. We can practice a bunch of different exercises so people could try it out. Yeah. That would be helpful. And Lacey, it looks like you have yeah Lacey. Like wow. Hi, Lacey. I spend so much time on Zoom calls. I'm just used to raising my hands. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you for sharing all that. I just wanted to share. I don't know if it would be helpful for people, but um, so I work as a coach and I've done a lot of work with trauma and I know like the fight flight is very like trauma response, nervous system re regulation. Um, I was diagnosed with FSHD when I was 12 and I'm now 38. So to me, that was a pretty traumatic experience at 12, which I feel like no one talks about around like disabilities and chronic health conditions. Um, so one thing that I really love is actually like releasing work, like trauma kind of release work. So shaking, like literally anything in your body you can shake, screaming, crying, literally throwing a tantrum. I love to like play a song for anger and a song for grief just to like contain it. Like the releasing pieces are something that's been really important for me, especially when I feel like there was probably decades where I did not allow myself to do that. And then now I'm kind of like getting it out and catching up. So I just wanted to share that as a as a tool too. Lacey, I love that. I often will say to people, like, especially with FSAP, we can't always like exercise vigorously. So screaming into a pillow is an enormous release also for that stress response. And I think that that's why I love the little trampoline. The bouncing is really a nice release um, in that as well. Because, you know, our bodies store trauma, you know, and having we can't always let go of things in our minds but we can find ways to let go of it physically and then that communicates to our minds that oh we can we can relax a little bit i'm sure lacy you could probably offer something to a lot to this group and sharing some of your your techniques you know and and, and doing something yeah thank you for sharing that yeah thank you anyone else have like a question or a comment or um or even an observation of just doing that brief stop exercise. I have one separate question, but Rakesh, it looks like you came off me when you're asking one. No, no, I, was, I, I don't want to hog the room. So if, if you want to go, go ahead. I, I, I just had something to add on. So uh, by all means, go ahead. Okay. I mean, if you're going to go first, I was going to go a little bit of a different direction. So. Oh, okay. Um, do you have something or are you going to go? Uh... You can go first now, Father. Okay. So um, I, I just wanted to kind of, uh, you know, I, I guess give hope to, to, uh, to, you know, just not this group everywhere, you know, about this, uh, w what we're going through. So um, the the way I got diagnosed at age 50 is um, I had another neuromuscular uh, condition, which is much severe. I don't know if you've heard about my senior gravis. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's what took me to a neurologist. And um, yeah, so I was going through fall. So, so those who don't know, it's a, uh, it's uh it's an acute neuromodular conditions where you know your muscle loses uh, 
strength. Uh, it's basically autoimmune disease, um, and the your body's attacking the uh, neuromuscular trans, uh, transmitter uh, transmission junction. So, um, fast forward, um, you know, when I started getting better, um, you know, I was like you know, what can I do to help my symptoms? You know, I know mindful or meditation. So I was like, you know, um, we can use our mind pretty much to, you know, to, to see how the world we want to see. So I was like, then I can, you know, train my body to say, hey, don't attack your neuromuscular junction, you know. So I started meditating on that, you know, I would, try to reinforce that, hey, your neuromuscular junction is not your enemy, it's your friend. You know, I would basically uh, do my meditation exercises. I would focus on whatever muscle was I was feeling weak. And since past June, you know, um, I'm pretty much not experiencing any symptoms at the moment. So, um, you know, you, they say you never... Uh, get cured from autoimmune diseases, but, uh, you know, you go on remission. Um, and I almost feel like telling, you know, people, my uh, MG, uh, those groups I go through that, this is what helped me. But, you know, since I have, a, you know, the FSD, I was like, okay, I can be 100% sure until I am, you know, I don't want to say it out. But, um, and I'm thinking, you know, the same way I help with my, um, autoimmune disease i can you know yes we have this genetic inborn uh you know which which is a much harder thing to change right this is something your body is basically programmed right you can deprogram your body so that it doesn't break down your muscle you know i'm just thinking out loud here so one way i i use it to cope with my pain that's one thing i i go through more often is you know I try to uh, say, so my neck is bad and uh, my, you know, my uh, calves and my quad hurt a lot. So when they're really bad, I try to focus on it and say, you know, uh, you know, relax your muscle, you know, don't, you know, tr try to, you know, send more oxygen, send more. So yeah, focus on those muscles and it helps me with the pain. So I do those kind of exercises and, you know, it, it's a tremendous help. So um, I, I can kind of positively not only say that um, it's helped me uh, to cope with it emotionally, but I almost, you know, almost feel with confidence that I was able to, you know, physically, you know, medically uh, make a change to my body with, uh, with my mind. So... You know, there, I'm so glad that you shared that, Rakesh. You know, there's certainly research from the MBSR world on um, the impact of meditation on autoimmune diseases. They've done, I know they've done some research um, with like eczema, which is like an autoimmune thing, and um, some other conditions, which, I, you know, I'm not as up to date on the research now, but there is a mechanism there of when our bodies are relaxed and we can lower cortisol in the body and other stress hormones, how can it not impact our immune system? There are mechanisms there that are being studied. Um, and it's, uh, it's very powerful stuff. Um, and, you know, it's practice. It's, it's kind of like, you know, we could go to the gym once and that can feel good, but the kind of benefits we get from, you know, exercising regularly are different than going once in a while, just like eating well, you know, one day will feel good, but eating well over the course of time has different kind of benefits. It's the same with meditation, that there are real powerful benefits to a practice like this over time. Um, yeah. Um, very, you know, thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks for giving me a chance. Yeah. Zach, were you gonna add anything else?
I'll save it for another time. It was kind of a high level question on something else, but okay. Um, yeah, really appreciate you walking through these things with us tonight. No, it's really my pleasure. I, I'm just gonna um, share in the chat my email address and. And uh, people are welcome to reach out to me if they have any additional questions or want any additional resources. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to, to share. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you, everyone.